Can everybody hear me? Hello? Morning? Yes, there you go. Okay, guys, thank you very much for once again attending the working group session. I see some guys are still arriving. A um, bit of a longish session today. Uh, click is not working. Okay. Arrow. All right, so I'm going to do a very quick ITAC user readiness checkpoint. We are then going to go into the collateral management sort of overview, a uh, recap of how it works in the JSC systems, hand over to Straight. They'll explain how they handle uh, collateral management within their systems. We're then going to come back and Martin will do a presentation on the off-book trade reporting model and how it integrates into the deal management system within our real-time clearing system. Okay, just a reminder, the slide, as I said, is always going to be here. Equity market upgrade is Q3 2016, and then our equity derivatives is Q2, Q3 2017, and two months thereafter, we would put in the currency derivatives. The slide's always going to be here. As I said, we're going to remind you. So we've had five working groups to date. Um, we like to think that they've been successful. We hope that you've had some value out of them. Um, on average, we've had some good attendance. We've had about 115 people on site attending, and we've had on average about 22 people through the webinar. So I think some people are still battling to get the webinar working. We've been trying to help them out and test with them, and hopefully we get more guys online as well. Um, we Clients did request that we give more information in the agenda, so I don't know if you noticed in the last one, we're trying to give you a brief description of what the topic will cover so that you can then use that to decide who in your office is coming. So although we think we've had good attendance thus far, we are concerned it may not be enough, and we don't think that there is yet representation from all clients. We are busy doing analysis of who's attended which sessions, and we will pick that up with you, uh, specifically where we perhaps see a firm has had no attendance thus far. We'll obviously like to make you aware and say, look, you should be participating. Um, all the previous working groups are at the link on the website, straight after the presentations. I typically put them up there um, for your perusal so that you can have a look at them. And again, we urge that if we don't have the right contacts and the invitations are not going to the right people, you tell us who they should go to, because we really need you to make sure you have the right level of participation for your firm. Um, the working group's completed to date. Obviously, today we're in progress uh, with the one on the 24th. There's one remaining for September, October, November this year. Uh, as you will see, we've put a note on the one for Monday, the 19th of October. I don't know how many of you are aware about the Eco-Mobility Festival that's going to be going on in Santon and the whole area around sort of Santon City. Up until the JSC is actually going to be cordoned off and restricted to public transport only, you will be able to get to the JSC, but we are concerned about potential delays and, uh, you know, that might be incurred because they're changing more into a one-way, et cetera, et cetera. So we are potentially looking at another venue, although if Ecomobility does become a permanent solution, we'll have to work around it anyway. But for the 19th at this stage, we are considering moving it to a venue maybe outside of Santon just to make it easier and more accessible for clients to join us. Uh, if you have some thoughts on the matter, please feel free to let us know. Okay, so I hope my uh, laser pointer is not working. Okay, so I'm going to walk over to the screen. Give me a quick sec. So we've covered quite a bit to date. Oh, I can't do that. So otherwise, they won't hear me. So we've covered quite a bit to date, uh, and I'm going to go through the detail now. We've sort of touched on some end-of-day reference data, and we've touched on some of the market data gateways at a very high level. Um, but as far as trading and clearing goes, this is your detailed trading diagram for the equity market, detailed trading diagram for the derivatives market, which will always be in your pack, just to remind you. And to give you guys a little bit more context about what we've covered to date, so from a trading perspective, oh, sorry, it's just too slow for me. Okay, so we've done the ITAC timeline principles and explained to you how much notice we feel we'll give you for the relevant periods. We've gone through the project 1A and 1B scope, so everybody knows 1A is equity market upgrade, 1B is equity derivatives followed by currency derivatives. We've done a high-level trading overview of the functionality that's available. We have done the high-level trading daily life cycle. 
We've also made you aware of the trading front end decision. We will no longer be providing a trading front end. And this is a very important thing for clients. And we are going to be having a showcase day with our software providers. We're just busy collating the software provider information, getting the key contacts. We'd like to have a showcase day where they can come on site at the JC and have their software or their functionality that they will make available to you um, available for discussion. You can then come and meet the different software providers and understand what they're looking to offer when and hopefully start engaging around your front end decision. We've also gone through things, some important considerations on the JSC services agreement. Okay, the fact that it currently is used for the equity market, not used for the derivatives markets, but if you need connectivity to the derivatives markets, both for trading or clearing, you will be signing a JSA schedule. We've also given you some considerations for if you want to use shared infrastructure, you can, but you have to use an accredited SIP. We will obviously go into more detail around those topics at a later stage, including the fact that if you want connectivity into the JSC, you must go through an accredited network service provider. We've spoken about um, high-level functions and messages of the trading gateway. Obviously, once the detailed specs come out, we will go into more detail. We've given you an overview of the trading firm structure. We've given you an overview of the trading drop copy functionality. We've gone through the entity and account structure diagrams, and we've touched on user access and enablement and how we propose it will work and some of the standards we're looking at using. From a clearing perspective, okay, again, the ITAC principles, we've done the scope, similarly the way we did for trading. Uh, we've given you a high-level clearing overview. Uh, we've actually made you aware of some of the clearing member topics that we would like to discuss with the market and give you feedback on things like collateral management, uh, the trade reporting model, which is going to be covered today. Uh, again, important considerations, your JSA, your SIP, your NSP, that's all going to be applicable. Deal management front end, again, we're not going to be giving you a front end for derivatives. The current front end that's in use by clients falls away and that you guys need to start engaging with software providers to replace those. Um, we've given you a high level daily life cycle of the clearing system. Uh, we've gone through collateral management in some detail. We're going to recap a little bit today so that you understand how it integrates to straight. The single integrated end of day process, we've taken you through around our thinking and how we believe this is going to work. Um, interfacing to clearing, so in other words, how you will do real-time clearing and the eMAPI API and the functionality that it's going to give you for deal management. Very much at a high level. Again, once the specs are published, we'll go into much more detail. Um, we've spoken about the alternate clearing member concept. Um, we've spoken about the real-time clearing interfaces and the functionality that you'll get, and obviously gone through the deal management functions. So it is quite a mouthful. It's quite a lot. All of this is sitting in the previous presentations. If you're looking at this thinking, huh, I never saw that, please go look at them. If you have any questions, you can let us know. So we're trying to just contextualize this because some of the guys have said, mm, don't quite know where so some things fit in. So we're trying to build the picture and show you logically where some of the stuff fits in. That's it. I'm going to hand over to Alex. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, morning, everyone. As Sandra said, um, there has been some feedback on the, uh, particularly on the deal management and clearing side, as to uh, you know good sessions, but um, some people are struggling to see where everything fits in. Uh, with neutron nucleus today, trading and deal management is very much tightly coupled. Uh, in the new world, you're going to have the Millennium IT and Sonoba being very much loosely coupled. So we just thought to give you um, a summary of the functions performed by the the Sonoba platform. And, and just sort of recap topics covered to date. And then we'll get on to um, collateral management, a very brief recap of JSE collateral management, and then Anthony van Eerden from Straight giving the, the straight perspective on the collateral management solution. So uh, this is a, a diagram just summarizing the functions of the clearing platform uh, and putting it into context as to which entities and, and other systems interface with with uh, the real-time clearing system. So the first uh, the first function is receiving the trades. That will be done in real time as trading is happening throughout the day. Deal management is then facilitated on the clearing platform. Uh, as trading and deal management occur, position keeping is performed and position updates are published on, on the eMAPI. Um, risk management, key function performed by clearing, 
uh, both the, the intraday, i.e. post-trade risk management um, in, in real time or near real time, and the end of day margining, margining runs. Uh, collateral management and settlement, which are now very closely uh, interlinked. Default management, and then um, a number of non-market facing functions, uh, valuation, stress testing, back testing, are also performed. And underlying all of this is reference data. Uh, the master reference data lies outside of uh, RTC, but of course there are reference data, reference data management functions performed by RTC. Um, we see clearing members and trading members interfacing with the RTC uh, system via the eMAPI. Um, we've then got the important touch point to the straight collateral management system, and, and we've got uh, clearing members, trading members, clients, and CSDPs interfacing with that system as well. Uh, interfaces to the settlement banks and authorized FX dealers for the payment of um, margins and, other and, and fees payments. JSC internal systems, like I said, master reference data is housed in that block. Um, our central billing system is there. The JSC bottom left corner, JSC information delivery portal, that's IDP, is where we'll be publishing most of the static end of day type of data in the form of files. And of course, top left interface to the trading system. <clears throat> So I'm just going to run through the topics that we've covered to date um, in various categories. The legend on the side, if, if it's marked with a green uh, dot, then we've covered it and covered it fully. Um, don't intend covering it further unless there's specific requests to do so. If it's yellow, we'd ha we've had an initial session at a high level and we're planning further coverage and then red is not yet covered. So we've given an, an overview of the clearing uh, system and its functions and the daily life cycle. <clears throat> Settlement and collateral management, as I said, these are uh, sort of very much linked now. We've covered the, the move to a single end of day run, uh, the end of day balancing process, the settlement of margins and fees and other cash, um, and, and the fact that we're going to, as today, provide for an ad hoc intraday margin call. On the collateral management side, we've had sessions both on the principles and the processes for the acceptance of securities and foreign currency collateral, uh, covering both the end of day and intraday processes. And as I said today, Anthony will give us the straight perspective on that solution. Margin methodologies we covered at a very high level. Uh, the main message there is that we are going to be going live with the current JSPAN methodology with any existing uh, margin add-ons, the liquidation large position add-on, and that we're looking to move in future to a HISTVAR portfolio margining methodology, which will give us greater flexibility in margin offset. Um, as I said, though, not going live with that. The other key message there is that we, we welcome software providers to develop uh, systems to replicate the margin methodology to help clearing members balance at the end of day. So we encourage you to uh, contact our risk team uh, we will, the, 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 specs, the specs are on the website and we'll be publishing any updates in due course and let you know about those. Post-trade intraday risk monitoring, um, we covered this briefly with the clearing members last year, but in, in the formal working group sessions we haven't yet covered this. It will be in one of the upcoming sessions. And this, this is about the uh, intraday risk uh, exposure limits um, that are going to be monitored as trading and as deal management is is happening. Um, we'll be recalculating initial margin and other risk exposures, comparing that to limits set by the, the clearing house and the clearing members and members. And if those limits are neared or breached, then exposure updates and alerts are published on the API. Default management will cover the, the, the default of a client trading member and clearing member. Like Sandra said, we did uh, in a session with the clearing members earlier this year touch on the concept of alternate uh, trading members and clearing members. Um, likelihood is that we won't be introducing that concept, uh, at least not for, for phase one go live. There are a lot of practical and cost implications of that. <clears throat> right, the other, the other main uh, category of functions performed by the clearing system is deal management. Um, we had a session on the 15th of July where we communicated principles uh, relating to the trade reporting and deal management in an agency and principal capacity. Um, and there was also an equity derivatives market notice that went out on the 14th of July around that. 
And today we'll unpack the deal management functions in context of those principles in more detail. Then looking at uh, some of the more, more technical aspects, we covered entity and account structure. Uh, we covered user access and, and enablement. We've touched on flows out of, out of the clearing system on the EMAPI, um, deal, deal and position updates and reference data and pricing updates, which will be, well, that'll be predominantly on, uh, on the RDP service. And then billing structures and parameters we haven't yet covered, but we'll, we'll cover uh, how you access the various data elements that you require in order to replicate the JSC's billing methodology as part of uh, end of day balancing. And then as we get closer to, to publishing uh, EMAPI specifications, we'll cover those uh, in detail, technical sessions on those, as well as the, the formats of the, file specific, of the files that would be published on RDP. Uh, what we've said in terms of the EMAPI specifications is that we'll publish the specs at least 12 months before go live. But we are aiming to, to get those out to you sooner. And then there are some uh, clearing member or post-trade functions that are facilitated by the trading system, uh, key one being pre-trade risk management. Haven't yet covered that, but we'll do so in an upcoming session that will talk to permissions that you can set on the, on the trading system, either by instruction to the exchange or on the API. Um, limit the various limits that the trading system caters for and controls such as kill switches, um, throttling, etc. Uh, monitoring of trading activity we've covered briefly. So if you're a clearing member wanting to monitor the, the trading activity of, of your trading members and their clients, you would uh, we've covered how you would um, do that via the drop copy and the post-trade gateway and perform on behalf of activity market data. The detail sessions will be in due course on the trading side. And then there's a number of uh, general user readiness topics that it would be relevant to both post-trade and trading. Uh, which we'll be covering in due course, some of them only once we get closer to the, the market testing and go live. Connectivity, uh, we will cover bandwidth as well, disaster recovery, any JSC rule and directive changes. Um, there will be some particularly for collateral management, customer testing and conformance, the JSC services agreements, and uh, closer to go live data take on and other preparation activities. Uh, this diagram you would have seen before, I'm not going to dwell on it, um, it just shows the various functions that, that are facilitated on the various interfaces, on the left the trading, again if you want to monitor trading activity you connect to the drop copy and post trade gateways as well as the market data gateway, which is where open interest amongst other market data will be published, and then on the EMAP, your deal management, collateral management, intraday risk monitoring, trade and position updates, and information delivery portal, again, for the static end of day type of data. Again, this, there'll be some overlap here, but just to contextualize from a daily life cycle point of view, what functions are happen happening in the various phases. Intraday, throughout the day, deal as trades are received in real time, deal management is performed on the clearing system. Uh, position updates and open interest updates open interest pushed back via MIT. Uh, those go out post-trade risk monitoring in real time. Um, the uh, initial margin and other risk exposures calculated as trades are, are happening and deal management's occurring. And variation margin, we're looking at introducing a, a snapshot every 15 minutes or 30 minutes, or as the case may be, publishing VM updates uh, on all portfolios down to client level. Uh, securities collateral and uh, substitutions and top ups, uh, top ups can ha will, will happen throughout the day. Um, client maintenance and new contracts. At certain times in the day, <clears throat> uh, we'll have a. We've spoken about in the, in the collateral management sessions a, a collateral management intraday batch process that's to cater for the flexibility to change the mix of assets that you've posted as collateral against your previous day's margin call. Um, as today, you'll have your, your cash payments of the previous day uh, margin call due by 12 o'clock with the acceptance of foreign currency, that'll, that'll be applicable as well. <clears throat> Benchmark rates such as your JI bars published as well at specific times in the day and then early valuations prices like today for the unit trust uh, managers uh, published at a specific time. 
At end of day, we'll publish closing prices, followed by the margin and fees runs, balancing to the clearing members. That'll kick off the collateral management process and the pledging of securities collateral. And then uh, calculation of the ZAR and the FX cash payments to be settled the following day. And finally, preparation for the next day. Um, we are envisaging to do this at end of day, so there isn't a rush at the, the start of the day the following morning. It's the download of margin parameters, uh, various reference data fee parameters, etc. Other end of day processes, um, <clears throat> these are non daily processes. On a monthly basis, interest on cash uh, is paid, uh, calculated daily, but paid on a monthly basis. <clears throat> and portfolio transfers and corporate actions, as and when they are applicable. And I'm going to hand over to Brett now just to, we're not going to recap in detail on collateral management, but just to introduce straight and refresh your memories as to what we've covered in previous sessions. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Alex has mentioned, it is more a recap before I hand across to Anthony from Straight to go through their solution itself. Um, so just touching on a couple of things, the first part as presented previously, we are looking at taking securities collateral and potentially foreign currency collateral as part of our project one when we go live with the interest, uh, interest rates, equity derivatives and currencies. Um, there are still discussions happening with the Saab and National Treasury in terms of the currency at the moment. Um, in terms of securities collateral, what we have agreed is there's a couple of things around that is that it can only cover your um, initial margin and uh, additional margin would have to be still covered in Zar cash, unfortunately. Um, and we've also agreed that there would still be a percentage that is called as our cash as part of that initial margin. So we will not take the full 100% as securities collateral. There still would have to be a our cash element that's associated with that as well. Um, the second part in terms of the foreign currency, as mentioned, we are in discussion with National Treasury and Saab, and we are hoping to have that push through before go live of, of Project One, which will allow more than none residents at the moment to put up currency collateral, which is where the Saab's view is at the moment. And we, we are trying to see if there's other areas we can push that as well. Um, in terms of the solution and integration, we will be using Straits Collateral Management System, which Anthony will be going through some of those details. So we have given notes that we will be using that system. And more importantly, which is the next part, is the pledge construct. We, we are going to go through a pledge construct opposed to the arts and arts sessions. And the big thing that sits behind that as well is that those pledges will be directly from the client or the trading member into JSC Clear, so it will not go through the clearing member. It's a direct pledge, which will be perfected within the JSC's rules when we, we change, change the rules itself. So from a structures perspective, we'll go into those details in subsequent um, sessions as to how you load those accounts, what you get notified in terms of the security collateral that's been pledged. And also when we go through default management, we're going to have to explain to you what happens in a, a situation where there's a default and what happens with the actual securities collateral itself and currency for that matter. Um, the one important part which Anthony will go into as well is that to uh, partake in the securities collateral, you will have to open up a segregated depository account at straight or an SDA account. But Anthony will go into some of those details as he's going through his slide presentation. Um, what we have agreed as well as an end of day process will cater for pledge of securities uh, collateral against initial margin. As I've mentioned, it will be a minimum czar cash balance that would have to be called for czar cash as well. Um, the intraday processing will cater for changing of the mix of the collateral or top ups or the release of securities and cash, which I'll go into a bit more detail. The intraday batch process, and here I'll go into the detail, um, the intraday batch process, this is an outstanding discussion with the clearing members at the moment in terms of the timing behind this. But what we have looked at is on straight um, settlement side of things, so bonds and equities, what time those settlements normally happen. And the logic there is once that settlement happens, purchases, which would have settled, would then become available for securities to be pledged again. So we're looking at about 11 o'clock in the morning. But that also is dependent on commercial bank funds as well, because once we do the core of cash, release of cash, the clearing members got to pay to the trading members and to the clients. So we need to make sure that there's sufficient time for them to do that through central bank funds before they close for the day. So we have put down at the moment 11 o'clock, but that may change as we get closer to, um, to, to the time period that's involved. Um, the substituting of securities for cash and vice versa, and literally what, the way we've actually designed this is that um, at the 11 o'clock cutoff time, we could have a situation where we will release securities for cash. So basically the guy's got a purchase that's settled, the securities become available, he now wants cash back, so we then release the cash back to them. Or vice versa, he wants to take his securities away because he's got a sale on the market, so there's a withdrawal against those securities and he needs to put out cash against the position, which again, this will go through the clearing members from an authorization perspective, 
And once authorized by the clearing member, only once we get the cash at the clearinghouse will we actually authorize the release of the security. So there's a couple of minutes that would be over collateralized, but rather that than that than being under collateralized in terms of the process itself. Um, regularly throughout the day, the state will do substitution. So literally, we will give them a, um, a notification in terms of what securities are available or allowed to be pledged to the clearinghouse. Um, throughout that period, they can substitute the different securities to make up the, the amount that is required from a JSC clear perspective. Um, and as part of that process, the JSC will also give them new values or mark to market values throughout the day as well for them to do mark to market top ups around the actual security. So, with revaluing the security straight, will then do a top up of other securities to make up the balance that is required. Or if there's no other securities, I'll then notify the clearinghouse, will then initiate a cash call, which will be at the 11 o'clock cutoff time as well, to top up that initial margin or the actual margin held by the clearinghouse itself. Is there any questions before I hand across to Anthony? Welcome, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. Um, Sandra asked me to keep this presentation pretty short, so I'll take questions. Okay. Guys, to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of information around collateral management, and we don't want to flood you with too much too early. So I'm just going to give you a very high-level view okay, on how it works. Okay, so let's just have a look, cast your minds back a bit, which I'm more sure you're familiar with after the global financial crisis. A lot of regulation has come out for greater collateralization of financial transactions. Um, but we're not going to go into too much detail, just, just to actually point out that there's going to be a lot of pressure on, on the availability of high-quality liquid assets. And when we speak high quality liquid assets, we're talking as they rank cash first, government bonds, then moving down to your equities, and then perhaps corporate bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So by the construct that the JSC are using, okay, which is pledge, it's going to lock up quite a lot of high quality liquid assets, which is going to make a bigger call on cash, and it's going to make cash a little bit more expensive to place. Okay. But we're not going to get into that technical detail. What's more important is just a quick diagram there on the impact of, of the regulations that are coming down. And it's important to see that 2016 is going to be a crunch year. Okay. I point that out because it's not going to just be a crunch year for the banks, the JSC. It's going to be a crunch year for the financial markets, guys. So what's more important is that we look at something and we call this at straight the four R's. Do I have the right collateral to cover the right exposure at the right time and at the right place? Okay, so just bear that in mind that if you don't have automated systems when it comes to moving your collateral around to make sure you get it to the right, uh, across the right exposure at the right place, it's going to put a lot of pressure on you from an administrative manual intervention point of view, which will bring with it a lot of operational risk. Okay, so one of the reasons why the JSC have partnered with us, not because they're a big shareholder, that's because we have an automated solution that's been provided to us uh, by an international CST called Clearstream. That solution has been in operation for 25 years. They service 74 central banks around the world, and they've provided this collateral management solution to us on a white label basis. We're not the only CST to be using it worldwide. Uh, the Australian Stock Exchange are using it. Spain are using it. Brazil have been using it for three years. Canada are looking at it, Singapore are coming online next year, Norway are coming online next year, and there's a couple of others in the pipeline. So it's a well-tried and tested reliable solution, fully automated. So overall how it works, okay, and why it's straight to actually involved in it. Because we are the record keepers of all the dematerialized securities, the operational efficiency around using this platform are vast. So the platform, which you can't see because it's a, a very light-colored circle there, the platform effectively manages matching your collateral exposures where it's on a bilateral basis. And for ITAC, it's going to be on what we call a unilateral basis. So unilateral means that the JSC will submit what it considers the net exposures across clearing members, trading members, and clients. Okay. And because they're going to <clears throat> excuse me, be acting as the CCP, whatever their net exposure is, that's the correct exposure. Okay. 
There's an interim solution which I'll show you, which will require submission by both the um, clearing members, trading members and clients, okay, which will then be matched by the solution to make sure that the exposures match before we do the collateralization process. But what the functionality ensures is it looks at the eligibility profiles that have been loaded into the solution by JSC, because they are the ones that are going to be determining what securities they're prepared to accept. It will also do intraday collateral, sorry, beginning of day collateral valuations, and then moving down the line, depending on which solution the JSC choose, they'll be doing further collateral valuations to ensure that the collateral which they have now received under pledge actually match those exposures. There's automatic collateral allocations done by the solution, so it's not that you, as the brokers, would have to manage which collateral you would be placing. That is something that, as the brokers, you would set up in the solution with straight to determine which priority you would like to place those uh, baskets of collateral in. It also handles automatic substitutions, which Brett has touched on. And those automatic substitutions, if, for example, you've got collateral placed with the JSC, if your trader decides to sell it because we are the settlement uh, around bonds and equities, Strait will be aware of what settlements should be taking place and substitutions will be triggered automatically by the solution at Strait. So that enables you to move your collateral without having to check to see what's on collateral before you sell it. Guys, there's a lot more detail that goes into this and I don't want to kill you with slides because there's still quite a lot of information to follow from the JSC on T3. As Brett mentioned, there's automatic top-ups, returns and cash calls, also automated within the solution. And finally, there's reporting. So that's how the solution sits on top of Strait. Because the solution is going to be generating what we call the collateral calls, you no longer have to send settlement instructions to your CSTPs for the pledge instructions unless your CSTPs choose that they still want to match your instructions against what the collateral solution is calling. Okay. What we're also working together on with the CSTPs is auto-commit to speed up the process. So auto-commit will work for equities. It won't work for bonds at the moment because we're still on the old bonds platform. But once the new bond system is in place, it'll actually be automated within the CSTPs. I'll stop there for any questions, because I'm sure you have a lot. No? Even my team ask me a question, please. Somebody ask me a question. No. Okay. So let's rather just skip on to just something for you to bear in mind. If as a, a trading member you've received collateral under session, the solution will actually monitor whether the collateral received by a trading member can be reused by that trading member. So a client placing collateral under session, non-cash, okay, can determine whether it is happy to have their collateral reused. Okay. So the system will monitor reuse, authorized reuse. So if the trading member is placed collateral and a session with the clearing member, the clearing member can actually place that collateral under pledge if it's authorized to reuse those securities. So the way the system, our collateral system is structured, we have full track of reuse of those collateral uh, parcels, okay, and whether that collateral can be reused or not. So it does enable, it does provide liquidity and provide the ability to place collateral received under session as pledge at the JSC. Okay. And bear in mind there will be some changes to the tax under equities collateral placed under session, so it won't carry the taxes that it currently carries. It does provide the clearing member with a bit more maneuverability around what collateral they're going to place at the JSC. Just to quickly taking you through the, who the players are in this market. Obviously, you've got JC Clear, the clearing members, trading members, and the clients, and then the CSTPs and straight. 
So we have something at Straight called our front end, Collateral Management Online, which is accessible via the internet, obviously with the credentials that you require. Access to that system will not be charged for, so it's actually free. Okay. Not often we give away something for free at Straight. The new integration that is required is from JSC to Straight to report those exposures. So that'll be for ITAC. And how it actually works is as follows. JC Clio will actually report the net exposures across clearing members, trading members, and clients. All the reporting is available on, what, on our front end, so they're able to see at every stage the collateralized coverage and settlement uh, at straight in the solution. <coughs> We will then send the settlement instructions to the CSTPs to auto-commit against those pledge instructions. Settlement will then take place, which you'll see as a broker on the front end that we provide you, you can see that the collateral is actually settled and any top-ups and substitutions. And then every day we provide reporting and that reporting is rep provided on a 15-minute basis at this stage. You can obviously set it up if you don't want reporting every 15 minutes, but that'll give you something that we call your collateral statement, so you'll be able to see what collateral you've placed and what collateral has been received at the JC. The interim solution that is being proposed for add-on margin works exactly the same except for two things. Firstly, JSC Clear will be submitting the instructions via a CSV file to Straight. It does require the broker to submit their net exposures to Straight, which will then match those exposures, send the settlement instructions to the CSTP. The CSTP will then auto commit. Settlement will take place, and then reporting is available on the front end, plus we send reports in hard copy. Now what's important about the solution, as Brett mentioned, is an STA account needs to be set up at Straight, but that gets set up via your CSTP and they still admin administer that uh, STA account. We call that account a target account because that's the account from which the collateral solution will select the available securities in line with the legibility profiles. You can also set up, and in fact if you're going to use the solution to manage all your collateral, you'll set up an SDA received account. So any collateral that you receive from a counterparty goes into that received account. Again, it'll be tracked whether it's available for reuse or not. Okay. High level, that's the solution. At some stage, we'll take you guys through a more detailed presentation only on collateral. Any questions? No. No, it's all Swift. So when the JSC integrate to us, it's Swift. When the clients integrate to us, they can come via J, uh, Swift messages or CSV or via the front end. Okay, we do have clients that are working with us on full integration via Swift standard messages. So if you are Swift enabled, we recommend you go the Swift route. Okay, otherwise you can go via the front end. And at some stage, we'll give you guys a demo on how easy it is to use that front end and how quickly the collateralization process takes place. We recently did a demo for one of the brokers using a basket of 27 different equities, which was collateralized within 15 minutes. Any other questions? Okay, you can catch me outside afterwards and beat me up if you choose to. Or you can actually set up a meeting and we'll take you through the collateral solution in a lot more detail and give you guys a demo so that you can see how easy it is to use and how efficient and effective it is. If there's nothing else, Sandra, who's next? Thank you. Um, Good morning. I'll be taking you through the trading part of the ITEC project that we're running at the moment. We'll be looking at the off-book trade reporting model. Um, 
and then afterwards how this will integrate into deal management. So effectively what we'll be looking at is how are you going to be reporting any off-book transactions onto the trading engine using the trading front ends self-developed from through your software providers or yourselves in-house um, and how they will flow. Again, this will be fairly high level. We're giving you some detail already that we know of. Um, seeing that we are doing this currently in the equities market. Um, so the detail will follow then when we have updated API specs and we publish those to the market. Okay, to start in, the post-trade gateway. Just the description of the post-trade gateway, what does it do? It's a real-time information on trades executed on the current trading day via TCRs. These are called trade capture reports. You get trade cancellations, trade reporting for off-book trades, and the details of trades executed on previous trading days are not available in the system. So effectively what this post-trade gateway gives you when you've connected to it is real-time management of all executed trades on and off-book connected either by you being a clearing member or a trading member, you get live updates as and when they happen. Literally in a few milliseconds or so, microseconds more, um, probably is more, more realistic of when this trade happened. We have a real-time connection, so clients will receive the details of each trade, and we have a query-based service. Query-based service will allow you to ask for any real-time notifications of trades that have happened. If you might have missed them, you've been out of the market for a bit, there's been a service interruption, you've disconnected for some reason, and you'll be able to ask the system what trades have you currently performed or what, where are you standing at the moment in sort of a recovery situation. Okay, trading members and clearing members can have access to both real-time and query-based service. If you cast your mind back to the previous presentation we had on the drop copy service, it is identical to the drop copy service in the sense of real-time messaging. You would have on the drop copy service received all of your orders, anything that happened to an order, a new order, cancelled order, anything that was done to that order in the system was copied directly to the clearing or trading member using the drop copy. It's exactly the same logic on the post-trade gateway. Here we call it the trade copy functionality, so you'll receive all of those trade copies set up to um, real-time to trading and clearing members. Okay, looking at the logical flow, similar to the uh, drop copy, we've just replaced effectively that black box with a post-trade gateway. It's a fixed gateway again. It sits just ahead of the trading derivatives trading system within which are permission tables. The permission tables we went into detail for drop copy previously. Effectively, what they mean again is you'll be able to be set up in a certain way on how you wish to receive these uh, real-time trade reports depending on how you want it set up in your market. So let's, let's imagine you have two or three different branches within your, your organization that you only want to see trades of. You can connect in certain ways that will only allow you to receive trades from a certain division, certain logical grouping of traders and so forth. You have the firm logging in again from uh, the different uh, comp IDs or interface users. These will be the logins that you will require. Uh, we've split them across the various markets in various colors and they will directly interact through the trading engine and interact through Post-Trade Gateway into the trading engine. So you will connect with these and again on the other side of the of the firm is where all the traders will sit. So in a cloud behind this gray, gray box there, which the firm is, that's where all your traders will sit. Again, comp IDs, interface users will log in, trader IDs and so forth will utilize a logged in comp ID, which has established the logical connection to do their trading and off-book trade reporting on the post-trade gateway directly. Right, on-book trade information that you will receive so the fixed trade capture report, we'll just call it the TCR message for ease of use. Message is used to transmit the details of each trade. On this trade, apologies, what you must send for each side of the trade is the buying trading member and the selling trading member. In case of the on-book trade, what you'll receive is, and this is where we go into the detail of the message, I won't go through each of these and what exactly you'll receive, but on the message, on the fixed tags, you'll be receiving the trade handling instrument and what its tag will be. So what the value within the tag will be, will be confirmation zero and the various trade report types, execution types, matching statuses and trade report transaction types and trade report types. This will just be what you will receive on a um, on book trade confirmation that has come down onto the trade capture report, message down into the post trade gateway. 
Right, each message will contain basic and value add information on the trade. So basic information obviously includes your trade value, your trade volume and so forth, and then value added will be the member firm, the trader group, and the trader ID will always be captured on each of these trade capped report messages. So effectively what you can do is every time you get a confirmed trade, TCR message coming down to you in real time, you'll easily be able to identify which trader, which trader group, um, and which firm has done that, obviously only be your own firm if you're connected as a trading member. If you're connected as a clearing member, you'll be able to see immediately which firm, trade ID, and trading uh, member has performed a certain trade. And that's real time again within a few microseconds of the trade occurring. Moving on to cancellations of on-book trades, if and when you should be allowed firstly or wish to cancel a trade on-book, you will do this through the post-trade gateway as well. This is where you will do your cancellation of on and off books. You will obviously need to get prior permission from market regulations to cancel any on books as per current rules and these rules as mentioned previously as well will be updated. So you cannot physically go and just do a cancellation of an, of an on book trade without getting the correct permission. How do you do it? An on book trade will only be cancelled if the requests are received from both sides. It's basically an agreement almost if you, if you look at it as an as a off book trade, one client one trading party will submit a cancellation, it gets sent to the other trading party and they accept and agree that this is now a cancellation system will process it and a trade cancellation will be submitted down to each member and to the uh, market data as well. So as we said, it's an off-book trade, so it's a, it's a trade message that gets submitted to say, please cancel this on-book trade and they get matched. Neither firm uh, may withdraw a pending trade cancellation. So once you've agreed with the trading with um, market surveillance and regulation that you are going to be canceling this on-book trade, you can't withdraw that request that you've now submitted into the market for obvious reasons. Unmatched trade cancellation requests. So if they haven't been matched by a, a counterparty, you may have submitted an incorrect trade ID. Maybe you've submitted the wrong side and so forth. They will sit in the system and be expired upon uh, end of day running they will not be matched and not automatically take place. So if there is a mistake and so forth, they could just expire at the end of day process. Right, then moving on to the off-book trade reporting, which is what the post-trade gateway is used for as well. So on the one hand, real-time trade notifications are sent to you, and the other side, off-book trading and reporting of any off-book trading activity will be done through the post-trade gateway. So member firms can submit off-book trades in accordance with rules on reporting via each of the markets. Each reported trade is subject to a series of validations and if accepted will be confirmed by the server. These validations again will be outlined in detail once we have the updated specifications. Uh, it'll include things like which side is which side are you on? Uh, certain off book trades will probably only be allowed to do you only be allowed to do them either if you're principal or an agency trade and so forth. So there's various combinations of what will validate an off book trade correctly. A confirmed off-book trade will be disseminated via the market data feed immediately again uh, if the trade type is stipulated as being published to the market. We can, via the system, delay certain off-book trades to be published to the market. We will look at that in closer detail as we update all the regulation and so forth. And this will go, so all, all on-book trades obviously get published to the market already. Off-book trading, the same thing will happen. So the market is aware of any trading that is happening not on screen for the market. Member firms can also request the cancellation of confirmed off-books. Works in a similar fashion to how the on-book. It's a submission from one member and the other to cancel an, an off-book trade. Um, if you're on the same side, which we'll get into, so if it's a single firm that is reporting a trade, we'll get into that a bit later in the slides. It'll obviously just be the one message from the firm. So these two trade reporting models are single-party trade reporting model. This is a, an off-book trade or a reported trade that you are sending to the system because within your firm, two of your clients have had a, have matched a trade that you're now reporting to the market from an off-book perspective. And there's the dual party reporting model which will occur between two member firms that have traded. So moving on to the single, it's the same member firm is on both sides of the trade, i.e. The, you're the buyer and seller. And the member firm submits both sides of this trade into a single trade capture report. So that's quite important. You'll just submit one single message which the system will acknowledge and accept. Um, we'll go through the details of it. So the wording is in these few slides and then there's a picture afterwards which explains 
the flow a bit more in detail. So a trade capture report ACK will be used and so forth. So I'll just skip through these and potentially just go to the, the picture. So here you can see there's a firm A, you've got the trader which is represented by this white bar um, on the far, far left of the screen connecting through, again, the post-trade interface users. Now, you'll notice that there's quite a few bars that are represented in this post-trade interface user, which again is the comp ID, same terminology. And only the one that is sort of captured in yellow is the one that's connected. So the trading firm is connected through various post-trading, uh, post-trade comp IDs onto the post-trade gateway. You are, the trader has utilized the yellow one, so comp ID one, for instance, to do this trade. You'll notice that the, this order gets submitted from the trader through the post-trade interface, and this is the trade capture report, the first trade submission. It either gets rejected or accepted. We'll move on that it is an accepted trade, and that gets directly sent back to the um, to the sort of logged in comp ID that the initial submission was made from. Once this has happened, however, once the trade is confirmed, you'll see a whole lot of arrows are pointing back to the firm, and they connect to each of the comp IDs. So once a trade, a valid trade has been um, actioned, so there's a bit of interactions between just the one comp ID, and then the system will submit a accepted trade to all of the logged in post-trade comp IDs. Even if you're not logged in and you come in a bit later in the day, this comp ID logs in, the system will submit all of these trades that have happened for the firm if set on this permission to the firm. So it's just something to note, um, not that you're thinking you've been flooded with uh, irrelevant information. It gets sent completely to the firm, all logged in comp IDs for that, for that firm. The confirmation will send, you'll see the, the last two blocks. Uh, there's a trade confirmation for the buy side and the sell side. Gets uh, two messages sent to you because you are in the same firm. And the opposite will happen when we move now to the, to the dual party system. Lastly, this uh, market data is updated with the trade that has just occurred. Okay, if there are any questions at this point, um, potentially. If not, we'll move on to the dual-sided trade reporting. So again, dual-sided trade reporting is just a different member on, on each side of the trade. And the uh, off-book trade is initially submitted by one of the parties. Apologies. Usually the seller, but it can also be the buyer via a trade capture report. Now, your off-book TCR must include the identity of both firms. This is how the system will recognize that you're doing an off-book with a firm. It will see the um, big code currently is what is being used in the equity market. Get submitted to the trading system. It will recognize to which logged-in uh, comp IDs of the counterparty firm it needs to send this message to say, here's an off-book trade. Do you accept or do you reject? Again, we'll just uh, skip through the, the wording because we'll explain it as we have the, the picture in front of us, rather. Um, so there's going to be an accept or a decline of the system, and we'll walk through the process just on the picture. So again, very similar to uh, the first picture. You have the trading firm A on the one side, but now we've introduced firm B on the, on the opposite side of the system. Again, trader, on the, trader A on the Firm A side submits an off-book trade to the system, goes through his comp ID, post-trade comp ID, and is either accepted or rejected by the system. Rejections generally take place if it's malformed, there's a missing field, uh, it's in an incorrect format, and so forth and so forth. Um, any trade that is, any trade capture report that is submitted with an incorrect uh, value that you've negotiated off-book is obviously not validated by the system but will then on the opposite side of the firm, from the firm B's point of view, will be rejected because you've agreed to trade at 10 Rand, but now you submitted something with nine. So the system will then, if we move to the green part, it's accepted this trade report that you've sent through as a, as a user. It sends, again, all logged in comp IDs on the firm B side will receive this trade capture report notification to say there is a pending off-book trade that you, have, you were party of waiting to be accepted. It will get sent to all of the um, post-trade gateway logged in comp IDs again. So it means that the system or software providers or software users, however you've written this interface, will need to ensure that this message goes straight back to the trader that it is intended for. So you will filter this through into the, to the, in your systems to the trader who will then acknowledge it through your front end and either accept or reject. For obvious reasons, you'll either accept it if it matches, if that's what you've agreed on, or reject if the trade information is uh, is not the same. 
Assuming this is accepted, again, it's only a one a single arrow flow that goes through the Comp ID into the system and notifies the um, match that effectively takes place. Once the match has taken place, there's a confirmation that again gets sent to both parties, similar to how the, the um, single side had worked. The buy side gets a notification to say you have now traded, this is a confirmed off book. The sell side gets the same and market data will be published once off saying there was an off book trade in this instrument for a certain value and volume. Okay, so it does look a bit uh, confusing potentially. The message flow is quite simple and in the API specifications that we will be publishing, you'll see exactly that how these messages come together. We've got a step-by-step -step breakdown of each of the fixed messages to show you exactly which tags need to be present, which tags have changed, what values should be in each of those fields and how you recognize these trades. Any questions at this point for understanding how this off-book trading will will work in the new world. Yes. 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 Okay, that was just an example as currently we're using the BIC code as a firm identifier on the equity market. We're looking at publishing a unique firm identifier for the derivatives market. So currently the way we'd set it up initially was the BIC code for the for the equity firms. It made sense, it was set up in the system in that way. We will provide new codes, this is part of the enablement process when we're going to start talking about how do you connect, what is naming conventions and so forth in detail a bit later on, um, and we'll give codes. What happens as well for that is the system on the CSV files, Alex was speaking about the IDP site, on there we, we throw all the data every morning, upload it and so forth, all the instruments, all of the trading segments, sessions and so forth, and in there is also a file that's called firm users. And we'll have an equity file and a derivative file. So every person will be able to have access to that file and understand this is a counterparty firm's code and the name, the legal name of that firm. And that's how you'll match it. Yes, so no. Short answer. Yes. Maybe getting into too much detail. We'll get there later. Okay. All right. Moving on then to the post trade gateway, the query based service. Like we indicated in the beginning, the post trade gateway is also used for you to submit requests and understand where you are currently trading at or what trades have occurred on your system for the day. You can set your system up in such a way that the Comp ID only receives real time confirmations of trades or the query based client which will only log in and request trading, which we call an own trade box download at the moment, at the same um, at the same time. The Query-based client must send a request to the server detailing how he wants to know what trades have happened on the day. And you may use the trade capture report request message to request these details of all trades or specific trade details. And how this will work is there will be a response from the system to accept or decline this. So there's always an interaction of an acceptance or a decline from the system back to you. So your trade status message and your trade results will be confirmed, whether it's accepted or rejected. And your trade capture report request message can only be used to capture a snapshot of the current day. It's not meant to give you the trades that have happened on previous days. The system as and sort of, sort of overriding understanding lives for the day, trades for the day, and uh, the historical data is kept elsewhere. But for the Millennium Trading System, you will only be able to see what have you done today and where are your trades at the moment. So looking at if you are asking for query-based service for all trades, you will request a trade capture report request with um, the tag 569 with a zero in it. This is just an extract from our current uh, equity APIs. The field will look like this. You'll have the, the, the tag 569 trade request type of all trades. Once you submit this, it'll look at your firm, it'll look at who, who you are and just go and pump back all of the trades that have been confirmed trades for the day, off book, both off book and on book for you um, for the day. For specific trades, the system will use a similar message except that you will now be using a different matching criteria. criteria. You can do this either by using a specific instrument ID, a type of trade, confirmation cancel corrected. You can look at the match type of the trade. So was it off book, continuous trading, auction or privately negotiated deal? Each of these will be explained in more detail once we have the APIs available. 
It will give you a specific party identifier, firm trader group and trader ID, and side of the trade, buy or sell. The specific order will either be a client order ID or an order ID. So that will be specified within your trade capture report. So every time you receive a trade capture report, there will be an identifier to what this trade related to on an order. So you can link it back all the way to your order ID that you submitted through one of the first sessions we did, which was your native trading gateway message. And that way you can link what is what has been executed to an actual trade capture report message saying this is a validated and confirmed trade. So again, just looking at how, how you will see this, how you'll code for this, is an, a bit of extra information that you're now required to do. Instead of using tag 569 to submit a value of zero for all trades, you're going to be using it the, the value of one to tell the system that you're using trades matching a specific criteria. The bottom sort of bracket there that we've used and uh, circled in, in green is a repeating group. So you'll repeat each of these fields as applicable to what you are requesting on the, on the system. Again, it'll be for an executing firm, it'll be for a trader group, or it'll be for a specific trader ID combination that you submitted. So fairly specific to what you can request this um, trade capture report of all of your trades for. Okay, and then if there are no further, further questions and so forth, we'll move on to integrate how this will now integrate to the deal management system. Otherwise, you can as well catch me outside or ask me any questions. Please. Thank you, Alex. Okay, so Martin has covered how you would report a trade into the trading system. What we want to do in this section is unpack the deal management activities that you can perform on a either a reported trade or a trade that's executed on the central order book. And this will be in line with the principles um, that we covered in the 15 July working group session and as I mentioned earlier, uh, that were covered in the equity derivatives market notice that was sent out. And those principles relate to trade reporting and deal management in an agency and a principal capacity. So before going into the detail of the slide, uh, the key message here and what, what that, those principles basically said is that if you act in a true principal capacity, you need to report a trade uh, into the trading system. If you act in an agency capacity, you can perform the same deal management that you do today, i.e. allocating that deal to a client or assigning it to another member or doing a tripartite allocation um, without a change in price. And and that, that is key without a change in price and you will then, the member will then be remunerated through a commission. Um, so it does have some implications for the processing of commissions and once we finished walking through these different deal management activities, Brett will uh, take you through our current thinking around the processing of commissions. Um, as we've said before, we are open to exploring options there that will help the market in, in collecting commissions. And uh, so we'd, once we give you the current thing, he'd like to really encourage input and feedback from you so that we get to a, a workable uh, solution. All right, so in a principal capacity, like I said, you would report the trade into the trading system. And then there are still deal management functions that you can perform, the accumulation of deals, uh, and then functions to move deals between accounts as you have today and to deal with exceptions where you've perhaps uh, allocated the deal where you shouldn't have or allocated it um, uh, well to an incorrect client, but I'll deal with the allocation in a principal capacity separately because that should really only be done on an exception basis. Um, on the agency side, we look at two states. Uh, the one is where the deal is sitting on the client suspense account and the other where it's already been allocated to a specific client account. If it's sitting on the client suspense account, like I said, you can do many other functions you can, or in fact, all of the functions you can do today. Uh, you can accumulate those deals, you can allocate them to a client, assign to a member, tripartite, um, and you can also perform deal subaccount mods and position subaccount modifications. The definitions of all of these are in the appendix. Um, I think most of you are familiar with them. The key ones are accumulate, allocate, and assign, uh, and tripartite, which we'll walk through in the, in the next slides. Um, if, if the deal is already on the client account, you can accumulate those, you can do an allocation correction, so if, if it was allocated to the wrong account, you can change the client account, and if that deal should not have been allocated to the client, you can do a principal correction to move it back to the member's 
house account. Uh, just some terminology, we've referred to trades and deals. A deal is essentially one side of a trade, so either the buy or the sell leg. <clears throat> so to unpack each of these in more detail, what you can do if you're acting in a principal capacity. Again, accumulate, uh, you can do the deal and position sub-account modifications, that is to move a deal or a position uh, between your member main account your, and your member sub account or the client suspense account and vice versa and you can do principal corrections where you've allocated that deal out to a client where you shouldn't have it was, it was a mistake you can bring that back to the house account <clears throat> uh, just to walk through the flow um, with a decoupling of trading and clearing that deal will be performed on the trading system you'll receive a trade capture report a TCR as Martin was touching on uh, the deal will at the same time feed down to the clearing, the deal management and clearing system and be published on the eMappy. You'll receive that deal uh, via the eMappy onto your member front end and then you can send in the instruction to accumulate or do the, do the, the other functions listed there uh, into the deal management system. As I said, uh, in a principal capacity, an allocation should be done on an exception basis only because you would have reported that deal, uh, the trade onto the trading system against the counterparty uh, involved at the, pr at the price um, appropriate and, and, and associated with that trade. So you shouldn't need to do an allocation. But if you captured the client code incorrectly, as that deal feeds down into the, the, the clearing system, it'll be shifted back to the house account and thereafter you can do an allocation to put it onto the correct, correct client account. Uh, the flows are quite similar. Deal performed on trading system, you'll get a TCR. It'll feed down to the, tra to the, deal, uh, the deal management and clearing system, which as I said would then determine that this is not a valid client account for this member and shift it to the member's house account and then uh, the member can send in the instruction to allocate that to the correct client account. Uh, looking now at the agency transactions, allocation will be performed um, as it is today um, and the flows are similar. I'm not going to walk through them. You can go through them in your own time or unless there's any questions around this. Uh, just a note, um, in the event that the agency trade is done directly on the, on the client account, uh, you wouldn't need an allocation. So if you book that trade on the trading system directly on the client account, you won't need uh, need to do an allocation once it goes down to the clearing system. There's some implications here for for commissions, uh, which Brett will cover in his um, section here after. And assign very much the same principle as the allocation and same flows. And as it is done today, uh, the receiving member needs to accept that deal. Tripartite allocation, again, very much the same as the allocation. It's just a, a client of another member for which a tripartite agreement already exists. And again, the receiving member needs to accept that deal. In, uh, in an agency capacity, you can also do accumulations, deal and position sub-account modifications and allocation error corrections. And again, flows are quite similar. Uh, just to illustrate sort of a combination of two functions, so this is where um, a member accumulates an, a number of deals and then does an allocation or an assign or a tripartite. Uh, the trades are executed on the trading system. All of those TCRs, trade capture reports, will be published back to the member. All of the trades, again, will feed down to the deal management and clearing system and be published on the eMappy. And then the instruction uh, is given into the clearing system to accumulate, the, accumulate those deals. The clearing system will, as it does today, accumulate the deals and calculate a volume weighted average price, publish that resultant deal, and then the instruction to allocate a sign or tripartite that QM deal is sent into the clearing system. Okay, and I'm gonna hand over now to Brett um, to cover commissions, unless there's any questions while Brett's on his way up. Slow motion. 
feels like we've walked back into winter as you walk into this room. I'm sitting at the back there and shivering at the moment. I can see everyone struggling at the moment. Sorry about that. Um, people are actually feeling on the floor to see if these vents are actually posting cold air through through the floor as well. So and, uh, apologies. Um, so going back a step, at the Financial Derivatives Advisory Committee a couple of weeks ago, there was a discussion in terms of taking a turn on a transaction or a trade or a deal. And it was agreed at that committee in terms of equity derivatives that we would no longer allow for taking of a turn on our system. So basically, the practice of taking a turn on an agency transaction would no longer be permitted on a downstream system where the deal management takes place on the RTC application itself. Um, we are investigating various options around this, and we have had some discussions with some of the clearing members around this as well. And we are aware that some clearing members already charge a commission um, on behalf of the trading members, which they then collect and pay it to the trading members already. So we are aware that this is happening, and we have seen some of the contract notes. So we are doing some investigation from a JSE's perspective to see how we actually take this forward. Should we cater for something in our systems, or should we just leave it up to the clearing members and all trading members to do that on their, their, um, on their behalf? But to highlight again is that on the deal management itself, our systems will restrict the taking of a turn on, on an agency trade. So literally, if you do try and take it, it will be rejected. It has to be based on a commission. So we, I'm going to go through what our current thinking is at the moment. We'd really like to get some feedback from the market as well in terms of their views or thoughts. Um, we will also be having discussions with the clearing members just to see what they're actually currently doing in the market as well, to see if it's something that we should be leveraging off or should we be creating other functionality around this. Um, so in terms of our thoughts at the moment is to actually deal with something around the deal management screen itself and include a field on there in terms of the commission to be charged. And the general idea there is that we'd actually raise it within the RTC application itself. It would be available for dissemination to clients and or trading members or clearing members. And there are particular areas also where we'll have to actually process that payment itself. So in the normal process, which I'll go through the diagram shortly, that money actually doesn't come anywhere close to JC Clear and, and so it shouldn't. But where you go into things like tripartite and assignments, where it's a across two different trading members or clearing members, there is a flow of cash between the members which may have to come through JSC Clear from a processing perspective. But as I said, this is where our thoughts are at the moment and we'd, we'd really, really like to get some feedback from the market as well around this. So in your normal flows, and this is a normal trade that's happened, it's been allocated to the client. On the right-hand side, we've got the commission in red. That would be available on a report, um, but in terms of the daily cash movement, it would only be the initial margin, variation margin, and fees that would be collected by JSC Clear. So the booking fees, not booking fees, the commissions would not be collected, would solely be on a report from a JSC's perspective, and those flows, the trading member would just take the commissions directly from, from their client's account. Where, as I mentioned, where it gets a little bit more complicated is in the assigned construct where you've got two different trading members that's involved with this and it gets assigned to another member in the market. And in the example that we've got up here, we've got two different clearing members just to amplify the example and two different trading members. And on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, the left-hand side, the trading member gives up or assigns a trade to trading member B. Trading member B has to pay a comms or commission back to trading member A, and this is where we saw or thought that this money would actually start flowing through JSC Clear. So in terms of the account summary report, we'd go to clearing member B and say, clearing member B, this trading member owes 100 Rand. We would then collect that 100 Rand and pay it to clearing member A, which would then pay it down to the trading member itself. So this is where we started applying our minds to see what those cash movements would be and where there was a collecting role for JSC Clear to play, play that role. Um, on the same token, so we, it's a sign I think I've gone through those details. And the same thing would apply to tripartite allocations as well, so where your client's got a tripartite agreement with another trading member. Same principle, the trading member A goes and does the trade, um, does a tripartite to the client B with trading member B, and exactly the same principle would apply where we'd think that in terms of the flows, if JSC Clear does do it through the RTC application, we would have to collect that money in terms of the commission and pay it through the channel from clearing member B to clearing member A for payment to trading member A in terms of the commissions itself. Um, as mentioned, we'd really, really like to get feedback from the market and what their views are. We will be taking this through the Currency Advisory Committee in a couple of weeks' time as well, just to go through those details as well. And I will be setting up some time or phone calls with the clearing members just to see what their views on what role they see JSC Clear playing in terms of the systems. That technically will then drive out our functionality or development around the systems that we are looking at doing at the moment. There's no questions. Thanks very much. Sandra, do you want to wind up? <laughs>